Hello, and welcome everyone to a very exciting and provocative session around humans versus machines. My name is Rashida. I'm the general manager for APAC at Celtra. During the course of the next 40 minutes, we will debate and discuss about artificial intelligence and its role in digital advertising. Consumers are constantly seeking for hyper-personalized experiences, which has put tremendous pressure on brands and agencies to develop and deliver high quality of creatives and content in large volumes. So the question here is, can creative AI make storytelling impactful and effective? Um, to answer this question, I'd like to call upon the stage uh, an esteemed set of panel who are subject matter experts as well, uh, who will discuss about the role of creative AI and its influence in marketing. Uh, please welcome Narayan Ivaturi, COO of Freakout Holdings, uh, John Kim, who's the creative, uh, sorry, the client director at Redfuse, uh, Anthony Baker, who's our executive director of technology at RGA, and uh, Philip Tabet, managing director at Mopcoy. Thank you and welcome. <coughs> Gentlemen, let's get started. Do you have your mic? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so we'll start with a Ready? round of uh, introductions. Please tell us about your role and responsibilities in your respective organization. And also tell us the last movie that you watched. <laughs> Definitely not Matrix. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for having us, Rush. Um, my name is Narayan. Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Freakout Holdings, uh, based in Singapore. Been in advertising all my life, uh, Omnicom, WPP, uh, Yahoo, a uh, couple of the companies I worked for. Um, I'm excited uh, to talk about this uh, because it's an interesting topic, but probably I'll have more uh, insights when, I, when we open the conversation. Last movie I watched was, uh, sorry, I don't remember. I'm more of a Netflix watcher right now. I don't even... So tell us the last okay. TV show that you watched. Uh, Black Mirror. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. John? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is John Kim. Um, I'm currently working on the Colgate Palmolive business um, at Redfuse Communications. Um, Redfuse Communications was uh, established back in 2012, um, and we're part of the WPP network. Um, my key responsibility at uh, Redfuse Communications is to ensure that we have the best people and the best tech partners working on the Colgate Palmolive business. And that's what I've been doing for the past uh, seven years or so. I think over the last 18 months has been quite an interesting time on Colgate Palmolive. Um, you know, we've really immersed ourselves in the world of technology, you know, things like MarTech, AdTech, um, things like Creative AI. Um, so I'm really excited to be here to have this discussion. Thank you. Um, movie, okay. Yes. So I've got, I've got an eight-month-old daughter, so I haven't been able to go to the cinemas for a very, very long time. So I'm with um, him. So Netflix, I think the last movie was Bird Box with Sandra Bullock, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Anthony? Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me to be here with you guys. So I head up uh, the technology strategy and the development capabilities for RGA in Asia Pacific. So work uh, quite closely with uh, our Singapore office, Shanghai office, Melbourne, uh, Australia, and I'm based in Tokyo. Uh, I've been with RGA for about eight and a half years. Uh, before Tokyo, I was uh, working with the guys in London, working in EMEA. So RGA, you know, does a lot of different things, but uh, I think that at the core, uh, we combine consultancy and design, creative technology um, to help clients um, grow their business by allowing them to change. And that's uh, a combination of stories and storytelling, uh, but also the systems and what companies do. That translates a lot into experiences, experiences that offer better value, uh, that aim to you know, make the, 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 the future a, a more human future, right? Um, particularly in APAC, we focus on very lean, very modern, modular architectures for digital platforms, allowing clients to move into market very quickly 
test new ideas, new experiences, new services with low investment. Um, but we also leverage deep technologies, uh, machine learning, uh, weak artificial intelligence, data, uh, from a very creative kind of like standpoint. Uh, and the latest movie, I actually, in preparation for this panel, I, um, I watched again uh, this movie called Hair, which is about like artificial intelligence and you know how the, the companion becomes kind of like super creative, writing all these kind of like different notes and uh, writing a book for him and then he falls in love as the like, just Brilliant. utopian. Brilliant. <laughs> Philip? Yeah, hi. My name is uh, Philip Tabet. I'm the managing director for Mopcoy. We're an ad tech company based out of the UK. I am uh, based in Singapore overseeing the uh, expansion of Mopcoy's activities over Asia. So what we do is we actually focus on impactful full screen mobile advertising that are placed in an ultra premium network of publishers. Um, and we typically work with uh, first tier uh, uh, premium brands and also luxury brands, so all the LVMH, the Richemont brands and so on. And uh, we help them reach their uh, high net worth audiences through these very engaging ads. Um, and uh, the movie, actually, I'm not very proud of this, but uh, on the plane I watched uh, Murder Mystery uh, on Netflix with Adam Sandler. <laughs> so, <laughs> quite entertaining nonetheless. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, Anthony, we'll get started with you. Um, so, in terms of creative AI, like what work have you been doing with your clients that you would qualify as creative AI? Right. Um, the most recent piece of work uh, that we have done specifically for Asia, it's uh, with Shiseido. So we have been uh, partnering with Shiseido for quite a long time, like a year and a half. Um, and we have been working with the Global Innovation Center and their research team. So they just opened a new Global Innovation Center in Yokohama in Japan. And they wanted to create um, an installation, an immersive experience to change the way that people perceive age. As you know, Japan has an aging population. There's a lot of uh, conversation about how do we expand the meaning of beauty across different times, across your whole life. Uh, and they wanted to leverage their skin science and aging knowledge into an experience that tried to change this perception. So we worked with them uh, to create this immersive experience that leverages um, machine learning algorithms and uh, narrow artificial intelligence for face mapping and uh, real-time, three-dimensional uh, aging simulations. So the experience goes like this. So you go in pairs, and you go into different booths that face each other, and through these kind of like screens that are like a magical window, you can have conversations with that person at different points in time that would otherwise be impossible. So a mother can go and have a conversation with their daughter, uh, and the daughter can see her mom when they are their age. Um, a pair of, uh, you know, a couple can go and have a conversation with each other uh, at the time before they met each other. Or something that is very interesting for Japan, a junior can go with their senior. And in Japan, they are supposed to speak in a, you know, respectful way. So when you flip the ages, there is very interesting results on how people change the way that they speak and the way that uh, they have a conversation, what they think about it. So the, the great thing about it is that it's not about the technology, it's not about AI, it's not about machine learning, it's how do we turn data and technology into a very emotional experience. So I think that for me, it's a very creative use of AI and it allows us to start creating these simulations uh, in real time about how people look like at different points of time. But I think that the next version of it, it's creating virtual humans that can react to you and look like at different stages uh, in their life based on your context and your, uh, you know, whatever your, your desire or your needs are. Sure. So from an advertising standpoint, John, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, what are the, some, some of the examples of creative AI? Like what brands are pioneering in this space? Uh, sure. Um, I'll give you an example that's actually quite close to home um, because, you know, on Kogay Palmolive, we actually just recently launched a dynamic creative optimization campaign. Um, and when it comes to advertising for toothpaste, it's actually quite difficult, right? Because the reality is that everyone uses toothpaste, so we have to reach a very broad audience with one piece of creative. But the challenge is, you know, that does that one piece of creative resonate with a broad audience. Well, the reality is that it doesn't, right? And that's where the role of dynamic creative optimization comes into play. Um, 
when it comes to toothpaste advertising, there are so many different variables, right? So do we talk about a lifestyle benefit? Do we talk about a product benefit? Do we feature pretty people or do we feature pretty landscapes? You know, there are so many different variables. So the first step was uh, for us to really understand what those variables were. Right? And by identifying who we want to speak to, we basically took all those variables, um, spit out different creative variations, and we served them up to the different people. Um, and the great thing about dynamic creative optimization is that we're able to learn real time. Right? So we, we get data straight away, and we can optimize in real time. And that's the greatest aspect about DCO. So like I said, we rec recently launched it. Um, I think we'll get results in a, a couple of months' time. So fingers crossed. Good luck. Um, and uh, so, Philip, from a future outlook standpoint, what are the experiences that are enabled through creative AI that you are most excited about? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I mean, very much what you, to piggyback on your answer, I think uh, <coughs> dynamic uh, creatives are definitely the future when it comes down to real-time applications. But um, I think when I try to um, think about an example that actually is quite exciting. It's not necessarily uh, the client said that we have right now. It's a case study that I actually uh, uh, read about. And it's a, a good intersection between an AI project that focuses on uh, creating something new, a new idea uh, to create something interesting. And it's a uh, collaboration between IBM and also a movie studio. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, it's a few years back, it was a, uh, a movie called Morgan, which was a, uh, a horror flick. And the project was that um, uh, can AI, can a machine, be able to identify or create a trailer um, using a certain algorithm? So uh, that was the premise, which was quite, quite exciting. Um, so afterwards, what had to be done is that the AI had to be taught um, exactly how to interpret certain uh, you know, uh, uh, visuals or audio or even uh, scene compositions and uh, use that data to be able to identify uh, which uh, parts of the movie are actually uh, scary or, or frightening or happy or whatever. Uh, so the idea was that um, uh, it was actually going to use this data set to find the sni snippets of the movie and, and put this trailer together, which it did. Um, so the AI algorithm that's used for this is, is something um, um, that ob is obviously um, uh, something that they call um, uh, supervised learning, sorry, and that's when uh, a human has to pretty much teach a, uh, a machine how to interpret certain deep emotions. And uh, I think uh, this is where the future lies. So we see today some practical applications in the healthcare, um, in, uh, you know, in um, retail and also uh, finance, uh, but um, can we, um, um, is there a potential for creative AI to be a true uh, collaborator? And, and create maybe down the road some, some authentic pieces on their own. So I think a lot of people today would, would argue that maybe it's not the time, um, that it's not, we're not ready for that. Uh, but I think it would be a mistake for us to uh, evaluate the potential of creative AI in the future using, let's say, the prism of what creative AI can do today. Um, so I think that uh, the fact that there's still a human element that is required today to piece it together doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the case in the next few years. Sure. So, Narayan, um, just tying to what Philip said about, you know, using data. Uh, what do you think, like, in your perspective, are the possibilities of creative AI? Like, what kind of groundwork would be required? So, um, yeah, so great examples. Uh, I would actually start with an example uh, of IBM again. Uh, Mindshare London did uh, one great exercise with uh, Wimbledon. Uh, I'm sure you guys have read this case study when uh, Roger Federer and uh, Rafael Nadal were playing. And each of the, so when, when the fans were entering the center court, each one was asked, are you a fan of, uh, are you supporting Rafa or are you supporting Federer? And based on who they were supporting, they were given a different uh, heart rate monitor. Uh, this is a case study, you can go and search for it. Depends on who was winning the point, the heart rate of the fans was going up and down. And they tracked all the data. And the beauty of it is they created music out of that. And how in the course of the game, which lasted for five or six sets, the music was getting flowing from the data of the heartbeats. Imagine the power of the data which is coming in. It's not a media data, it's not a regular creative data, but a lot of artificial intelligence went into it in supporting and collecting the data and creating a musical pattern out of the heartbeats generated from 
the fans of each player. And there are many, many case studies. I mean, I can go on. There are enough and more case studies where small piece of technology is getting used for an effective communication. And that's what brings me to the answer to this question. I think most of the time in media circuits, and all of us on the panel would agree that most of our, our, our endeavors are based on efficiencies. Our clients, our agencies, partners, and most of them are going after the efficiency metrics. But the, the, the secret sauce lies in the effectiveness of the, of the overall communication. And that's what we all of us as students of advertising have been taught in colleges and schools wherein uh, we said, how is this piece of an advertising more effective than the other piece and how is it communicating the actual message it's intended to communicate. And that is what we are forgetting in the jargon of programmatic and technology and a lot of other things. I think what creative AI brings back to the table is how effective the communication can be using this piece of technology and wherein we are assisting the overall uh, media delivery with a creative AI, with DCO, with a lot of other uh, technology which are available to us, bringing in the effectiveness back to the advertising. And as I was just talking to the panel members, bringing us the humaneness to the advertising. It's not a data point, it's not a device you're talking about, it's a human being you're talking to. And that is the humanness, or we are bringing back the humanness to the advertising, is what I think is the possibilities of creative AI. Sure. So, do you think AI can be taught to be creative? Like, do you think it can be, it can operate without guidance, without human guidance, you know, on the, on the basis of uh, pixel arrangement or color palettes? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting challenge, right? I think that we are talking about uh, a few different things that are very important. One is the use of data from a creative perspective, right? Less about the numbers, less about like statistics, and more about like how we are creative using data in a more emotional human way. The other part is the emotions, right? The sensibilities, understanding beyond the typical demographics, um, and being able to, you know, use technologies that like creative AI or AI in general, machine learning that allows us to train models that can react to input in real time. Now, we did a, a very interesting experiment for CAN where uh, we used the OpenAI uh, GPT-2 um, uh, algorithm, right? Which is, uh, it's an algorithm very comprehensive, like a breakthrough in uh, text creation, which allows you to tell, her, uh, tell it a phrase and then it will uh, write the whole story for you, whether that's articles. So what we did is we trained the algorithm based on the history of CAN entries, uh, you know, thousands of them. And then basically what you can do is like you prompt uh, a little bit kind of like a, a sentence or a question and it will write the case study entry for you. So sometimes it gets it really, really wrong, right? Uh, and you can tell that it's not able to understand or be taught about the cultural sensibilities, right? Especially, you know, in Asia. Um, but at the same time, I think that, as you were pointing out with the example of, of IBM and, and the movie, uh, you can teach models to take into consideration a lot of human sensibilities and human behaviors. Now, I think that we are not at the stage where we can create a general artificial intelligence to be able to understand context in a much more broader sense, right? Um, and at the same time, technology comes from humans, right? And humans are inherently influenced by their context and their culture and education. So the bias is always there. But we can teach ourselves and machines to be more um, understanding and be more considerate about all these different ideas. So I think that we can make a lot of progress in that sense. I don't think that we are there yet. Um, we could potentially teach AI how to follow the creativity of certain uh, masters uh, and then apply that kind of like uh, style uh, and help us elevate our creative intelligence, which I think that is the point. It's like how do we allow us to use um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and these technologies to elevate our creative intelligence, which it's more towards the sensibilities of the human being and the emotions. Right. So then how would you look at the entire consumer experience? How would you tie that in uh, when it comes from a creative AI standpoint? Yeah, so I would say, for example, uh, conversational interfaces, right? Um, conversational interfaces have the potential of understanding a lot more about your interest as a human, your desires, uh, your opportunities, your goals in life, your contextual family or kind of like thing. If you take that into account, 
then you can help people going from the end to end of the journey of buying a product, uh, renting a service, interacting with a brand in a much more um, organic and human way, right? Instead of like, buy this, here's like, you know, or product, here's what it's great. Uh, it's more tailored towards what you're looking for, what are your needs, and changing that uh, through time. So, Philip, how would you tie the whole consumer experience to Creative AI? Like, who, in your opinion, like which brand is doing it really well today? Yeah, I think it's more than just brand. I, I, if I could go back just one higher level, I think it's more industry. I think we spoke a lot about data. We spoke a lot about experience. And I think in today in the world, uh, at least in, in, from a marketer's perspective, we are inundated today with certain data. And I think there has to be a new system in place that can maybe uh, adapt and learn uh, based on, on all these inputs that are coming in as we're discussing. So I think there's, there has to be a shift at some point from, from data-driven interactions to something that is more uh, deep, emotionally guided experiences. All right? So I think the industry that seems to be spearheading a lot is the cosmetic industry. And we heard a few great examples here from Shiseido, um, which also are, are uh, right now buying up a lot of tech uh, from either Silicon Valley or from here to understand a little bit more how to connect a little bit more with their clients on a more deep personal level. So Shiseido definitely is one of the clients. For, uh, one of our clients is Estee Lauder. So uh, we work a lot with them as well um, to try to kind of interact these facial recognition uh, technologies to be able to customize uh, more or less the experience for the user as they're uh, viewing certain ads, let's say on Vogue or, 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 uh, or Marie Claire or something like that. Uh, so I think these are the ones. And, and also another example uh, would be uh, Mac as well. Um, I think they're going another step. I mean, they just opened up a, an experiential store in Shanghai not too long ago where they're pretty much uh, consolidating all the data points, um, uh, obviously all managed through the we, WeChat platform. But the idea is that they understand everything about you. And based on this, they creatively kind of curate the experience as you're walking through the store. And I think those are the uh, clients that we work with uh, that uh, seem to be kind of at the uh, forefront of, of this uh, creative AI uh, journey. Okay. So, uh, John, you spoke about uh, DCO. So, how does creative AI help us to deliver great experiences for consumers specifically? Well, I think, um, you know, when it comes to AI, I think we have to go beyond just creative AI because it's such a broad topic um, and AI can be used for so many different applications, right? Um, and I think we have to always put consumers at the heart of things, right? Um, and I think the power of AI comes from the fact that it will be able to anticipate people's needs before they even know they actually need it, right? Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example, right? Um, so imagine a Starbucks app. I'm sure a lot of you guys have it, right? Um, you use it to order a coffee every day, every morning. Uh, when, once you get to a Starbucks shop, it's already, re it's already ready for you, and then you take it. But imagine that you're doing that every morning at 9 a.m., but on one of the mornings, you have an early morning meeting at 7.30 in the morning. So through the fact that an invite goes into your calendar on your mobile, through geo-targeting and knowing when you're stepping out the door, and through traffic and public transport information, right, it knows that you are going to arrive at Starbucks at 7.15, right? So that app automatically pings you, saying they will, your coffee will be ready at 7.15, right? So I think things like that, right, when it, can, when it comes to AI, is going to be what really delivers, you know, uh, great experiences uh, for consumers, just beyond creative alone. That makes sense. Sure. And Narayan, what are your thoughts on this? on consumer experiences and how creative AI can help in creating these consumer experiences? Uh, I think any piece of technology we're using is based on how, how the wow factor will be created for consumers at the end of the day. If that doesn't happen, if the consumer is not interested, if the consumer is not excited about the whole thing, there's no point of doing anything in that sense. Um, yeah, the many examples, I mean, uh, um, I can quote one of the examples which I was talking about is uh, use of beacons intelligently. I mean, I know it's a, uh, slightly off, but uh, I, again, I'm talking about how data can be collected and used in a creative manner of, uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, if there is a fast-moving, um, something like a KFC, and uh, we did this experiment in Singapore, wherein if there is an app of KFC and how we can uh, walk into the store and with 
the embedded uh, AI technology, we can immediately say that your past three orders are this burger, this fry, and this cold drink. And so you can immediately go to the payment counter and already your existing pre-ordered are there ready for you to just put your finger and pay it and just get out of the uh, queue. So there are many, many user experiences which can be created in terms of uh, uh, creating uh, beautiful experiences for the consumer. At the end of the day, whether it is creative as one unit or as an experience as an entire unit, because creative is only one part of the overall journey, which is either a start or a middle or an end. But then the whole journey needs to be at, at, at you know, as a wow factor for, for the consumer. And, and that eventually results in the brand affinity or whatever the brand is looking at in that sense. Whether any of the examples we've quoted would eventually mean that the brand is more nearer to the consumer and those experiences are in, invaluable for the consumer because they want, to, they want to get more and more of those experiences uh, again and again. Sure. So speaking of invaluable experiences, Philip touched upon adding the human element. So Anthony, I'd like to ask you, like, do machines take away element of human emotional connection, which is the bedrock of brand connections? Yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? I, I think that what, what humans still have that are very difficult for machines to grab is the emotional sensibilities, right? Is the human uh, soul, the core, right, of what we do and how do we interact. But like tapping a little bit back to what we're discussing, Ideally, if we, if we talk about creative AI in the consumer experiences, right, I would love to have services and experiences that are actually creative, right, that surprise me, that understand me enough and understand my emotions. Is it a bad day? Is it a good day? Did I sleep well or not because my baby's waking up? Did I have like a bad day at work? You know, is it that time of the, the month where I feel like really depressed or uh, I'm exhausted or my holidays are coming up? So why these services are not surprising us? And yes, predicting for sure, right? This is my routine, this is what I like to do. But having that sensibility understanding to be able to say, you know what, Anthony, I'm going to surprise you today. It's not going to be a coffee, it's going to be bubble tea, black sugar bubble tea that is delicious, you know, or here's like some tune, right, that you have never heard before, and it's actually coming from China, but it's like super cool and you will love it. So I think that that level there, I think that there's a lot of experimentation. I would say that Google definitely is one of the big uh, heavyweights that is experimenting a lot with that. I think that there's the smaller companies that are experimenting a lot with the idea of like virtual humans, right? And being capable of actually understanding your emotional reactions and reacting to that. Some of the work that we have been doing to and being able to, you know, uh, relate better to people based on their conditions and their culture and their education. Not there yet, but I think that these experiments are happening, you know, all over the place. I think that one important thing that we shouldn't um, dismiss is that while we are still, stay, well, we are still in this uh, era of like coal mines, right, where only the tech giants have enough data to train very powerful algorithms at scale, techniques are becoming a lot better, right? We have like gener generative adversarial networks. We have like better techniques that allow smaller companies to build very creative tools um, that allows us to tap more in those like human sensibilities. Um, hopefully that <laughs> is not a, a deviation from your question. No, not at all. Um, so you're talking about all the possibilities, right? These are like ambitious goals. Yeah. Uh, Narayan, does creative AI scare you? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, to, to add to what Anthony was talking about, what we are talking about is cognitive thinking. I don't think machines are anywhere near close to cognitive thinking. Uh, you can train a machine to do A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z things, but you can't tell them the order in which they should do it. That is cognition. What emotional response we're talking about is the human brain is made up of billions of neurons which create the complexity of human brain as it is. I don't think any processor has the power of reaching even the one ten thousandth portion of what a human brain can actually do. So. Yet. I don't think, yet, yet, I agree, I agree, yet. And we were just talking about the point of singularity where the machines can reach the human brain and all that. Uh, that's all fiction right now. 
let it be fiction that's all in matrix movies and john connor movies so we'll leave it to that <laughs> we're not yet there um, it's fun to think about a point of singularity but i don't think it will happen in our generation at least till the time we are alive uh, it doesn't scare me it's a tool uh, what scares me is that people who are not trained enough to use the tool using it badly and creating bad experiences for clients and people to invest money into it which is i think the bigger scare so the scare is not the people uh, scare is not the machines but the scare actually is scared of the other people using it in a bad way uh, i think i'm more scared about untrained resources using these technologies and creating a bad impact out of it which creates in the overall bashing of the industry that oh this is all bad yeah. which has been happening for for some time now uh, john how about yourself does creative ai scare you um I think I have a slightly different point of view, slightly. Um, I think we're all You're in agreement. You're all about controversies over here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all on the same page in that um, we're not there yet, right? And I think with all great technology, there is always a tipping point, right? Um, and for machines to act like humans, right, machines need to have the ability to have emotion right um and emotion is extremely complex right whether it's how feelings how emotions are expressed hand gestures facial expressions how you say things the words you use it's ex extremely complex but when the tipping point comes when emotions can be transferred into data and that data can be transferred into emotions I think we'll see tr uh, tremendous growth in this area. And the reality is, and this is why I slightly disagree, the reality is that I think we're close to that tipping point because there are things like voice recognition, it's been around for a while. There are things like facial recognition, right? Um, and, it's, and it's advancing on a day-to-day -day basis. So yes, I think we're close to that tipping point and I question um, how, you know, the impact that will have on the industry that I'm in, you know, I'm in the advertising in this industry. And the greatest worry that I have is that if that point ever comes, I worry that creativity will become commoditized, right? It becomes a level playing field, right? And no longer will brands and companies have an edge when it comes to creative thinking, right? So it becomes almost an average or even, and I guess if that point comes, it becomes all about customer experience or consumer experience. So it will be interesting to see. So, uh, Narayan, in your experience, when we speak about converging creative with media, how can creative AI be merged with media? And uh, how can it help achieve economies of scale? It's already happening. Right now, as we speak, we are, we are in the programmatic world and more and more media is getting bought on the programmatic on, a, on an automated basis, uh, which effectively is getting mixed up with whatever data triggers we have. There are there are data triggers which are in your own platform. There are enough data triggers which can be, which can be used like a weather or like a location or like any other third-party data which is qualifying the user further for that moment uh, can be used. Uh, economies of scale obviously are I'm, I, as I said in the past. I'm more bothered about the effectiveness of the advertising rather than the economies of scale because that's the larger object of the brand. Because unfortunately, most of our conversations are, okay, I'll give you a better CPC or I'll give, it, give you a better CPM. Yeah, fine, we'll give you a better CPM. But has it worked for the brand? What is the bounce rate? What is the brand affinity lift? What is the consumer uh, offtake as far as, uh, you know, that brand is concerned? When we are talking about these kind of things, I think that's when Creative AI scores a lot, more than any other effective tool in the market. Because Creative AI is helping the consumer get the message in the right frame of mind, at the right time, in the right manner and colors and mixers and pixels and everything, whatever we train the engine for. And in that sense, the engine is getting uh, or, or geared up to deliver the right message at the right time, which is the essence of advertising as we all learned it. However more complex you can make, however number of data points you can achieve, but that's the ultimate objective of the brand to get something sold. Uh, if that objective is not getting met, uh, rest everything doesn't make sense. So uh, m more and more creative AI is getting used in uh, effective dissemination of advertising at the right place at the right time, more it is better for the brands and more it is good for economies of scale because your, your conversion, you don't need to because 
I'm sure a lot of people come here from the television backgrounds. We've all been taught about reach frequency metrics from day one. But reach frequency metrics only a function of how effective your advertising is that you need to touch base a consumer three times or four times or six times depending on the, uh, on the CNS uh, you know, possibilities of that, con uh, of that consumer, right? But in this case, better advertising delivered in a better manner with the right data, with the right intent will make sure that the advertising conversion is much more higher than it is normally. So the economies of scale are already tied into this whole aspect of how advertising gets delivered. So I think more and more, more power to creative AI and more and more we use it right, better for economies, better for the brands and better for the whole ecosystem. Cool. Um, so Anthony, um, who will solve creative AI first? Will it be platform companies like Alibaba or Google? Or do you think it would be creative companies like Adobe or Seltra? Hopefully, it will be me. But <laughs> if not, um, I would say it's, it's hard to say, right? There is like different uh, verticals and different angles and different perspectives. I would say that definitely Adobe is putting a lot of effort and investment into using creative to generate uh, asset, generate content, generate visuals, generate art, which I think is fantastic. Um, on the other side, whether or not you consider it creative AI, but Alibaba's is just like using their uh, AI and machine learning technologies to be able to not only generate creative, but actually test that creative, prototype it, send it out, and create sales projections for companies to know how much money they are going to make out of a product that it doesn't even exist. Um, but at the same time, then you have uh, you know companies like Google and Microsoft that are doing a lot of different experiments about AI that empowers other companies and other uh, entrepreneurs and other innovators to actually use those technologies to create breakthroughs. Um, you know, you were making a great point about like being immersive about uh, using AI for emotions and there is sound and speech and like all these different aspects of uh, really creative kind of uh, um, executions. One company that is super interesting is uh, called uh, Cosmos, I think, in, in Japan. And they have created a DJ AI, right? But it's not to replace the human DJs. It's to actually perform with the human DJs because they will listen to what DJ is doing, they will listen to the crowd, what the crowd is doing, and they will interpret that in a very different way, creating a better performance overall. So those kind of things are, are very interesting. Um, and then you have like you guys, you know, doing kind of like really using technology to create creative that is effective, that is actually there, that is reaching the people, that is kind of like helping elevate that creative intelligence in our industry. So hard to say, I would say that Alibaba is definitely one to watch. Uh, I think that Adobe in that respect, in terms of like generation and tools, it's, it's really interesting, but um, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of like, specifically in Asia, China, potentially Japan to a certain extent in the whole emotional robotics kind of like uh, field um, that is going to potentially surprise us. Sure. So uh, what do you think is missing currently in the uh, creative development process that AI can help with? Yeah, so, so that's an interesting one. I think that, you know, we were talking about like being more creative with data, right? I think that injecting data and injecting uh, creative AI into the creative process in our industry is still sometimes a taboo, right? It's like, oh, machines cannot be creative, right? Like, we are safe, uh, we are different. But the reality is that, as you were pointing out, creative is, and AI and machine learning are just tools that should help us elevate our creative output. So, for example, wouldn't it be better if creatives have these tools that allows them to create a lot of different variations of potential crazy ideas and maybe not so crazy ideas and maybe, maybe very pragmatic ideas and outputs and examples that help them to come up with better overall, more sensible, more human, more interesting creative. I think that that's what is missing to a certain extent. I think that the data literacy has to be spread across all the different disciplines. The same way that we say, you know, if creatives work with technologies and strategies together, then the creative output is better. So if we do that across the, you know, across the whole funnel, and then we have that data and that understanding from our consumers and using these tools to 
be able to understand better and generate better. That that's that's really going to elevate the the practice, I think. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is going to be an open question. Uh, Philip, Anthony, anyone can take this. Um, does use of machines and computers make us less creative? Um, creativity is a skill we usually consider uniquely human. What roles does AI or machine learning play in the creative process? John? Um, <laughs> I think um, it's similar to what I said before. Um, if we're looking at this point in time, um, we can't underestimate the power of AI, but at the same time, we can't underestimate the power of creative thinking, right? The bottom line is that um, people are emotional beings, right? Um, and we need to be able to come up with big ideas, and not just big ideas, but ideas that connect on an emotional level, that leverages cultural trends, that taps into human insights, right? So I think the power of that comes from human beings, right? And the way to leverage AI is how do you take that big idea and how do you reach people effectively and execute the big idea that is extremely relevant and personalized to them? So, look, I don't think there is one correct answer, I and mean, I think it's very, very broad, right? But I think it's a com uh, combination of both. Yeah, I would say that uh, we should also not underestimate the power of people, right? And the people that is, you know, receiving this creative and consuming this creative and interacting with brands. I think that you know, it's easy to think that technology and AI might actually commoditize a little bit the creative output and that it's going to become like really flat. But I think that consumers and people in general are going to force that not to be the case. I think that uh, consumers are becoming way smarter. Uh, they can distinguish between good creative and bad creative. Uh, creative that is, you know, not caring and creative that is really relevant and meaningful. So I think that that's, always going to push more and more. And I think that that's why creative AI needs to be a tool for elevating creative. Yeah, I think just to add to uh, Anthony, you had a really good point. I, I find that uh, when you start looking at the consumer perspective, you also have to think about the shift that are happening in the industry where now e-commerce and, and moving away from brick and mortar stores to a, to a digital environment. And how do we actually manage that relationship with the, with the client from this point forward? So if you think about the conventional sense is that somebody goes to a store, there is a salesperson that actually can use the full power of their brain to convince you that this is a good product for you based on whatever parameters that they have identified as important. But you lose that connection with the uh, customer when they are looking at your product uh, online. So the question is that how do you develop tools and strategies so that you can um, creatively um, show them things or explain to them certain concepts so you can convince them that this is the right product. So I think th there is nothing to be afraid of. I think this is something that we need to embrace and we need to utilize very well. Uh, but again, very similar to what we have said, I don't think that we can uh, replace uh, the human creative element, but we can certainly get very close to reproducing things that we have done well in the past. Great. All right. Oh, two, two. Last thoughts? Uh, uh, I don't know how many people know this, but way back in the day when movies got released, uh, painters used to go to each uh, house or each uh, area and they used to paint with their hands that this movie is going to release. For them, printer was a great technology innovation which created disruption and so on and so forth. I can go, you, know, you understand where I'm going this with. At every stage of uh, you know, at every stage of time, there was a technology which was the most disruptive technology which took the creative process to the next level. They could do much better with the printer, color printer they had, where they could just print out huge screens and they could paste anywhere they want to. And things came in when there was an audiovisual effect. Now things came in, there are YouTube trailers which the movies get released and they're reaching millions of people even without the movie getting released. So at every stage, that piece of technology which came in was a disruption in there. So the creative AI is a current disruption which we have. I'm sure there'll be much more beyond, but the creative guy, like somebody like a David Ogilvy, would still exist, creating the big idea, as John Kim would say, and use the technology to the best of his ability to create that impact. 
because as Anthony would say, I'm just summarizing everybody for you. But as he said, the consumers are getting more and more smarter and they're expecting much better experiences on a daily basis. So use of AI or use of new technologies would eventually help the creative people uh, and in various uh, creative hats to use that experience and use the tech better to deliver a better experience to consumers. And this is an ongoing process. This will go on. Okay. Thanks, Narayan, for summarizing what I had to say. <laughs> this also happens to be our last question. Uh, it's been a very interesting and intriguing session, so thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I hope you have found this session very interesting and you got some valuable information out of this. Uh, on that note, I'd like to hand over to our in-house maestro and creative ninja, um, Yukaya Pearson, who's also a product specialist, he will give you a walkthrough of the platform and how creative AI can bring uh, magic to life. Thank you. Thank you.